The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Henry Hamilton was 64 years old. He was discovered dead in his home on November 8th alongside two empty bottles of prescription drugs and a living will on which he had written, Do Not Revive, F. Obama. He actually had warned prior to the 2012 election that he won't be around if President Obama was reelected. And it appears he did actually follow through on that, committing suicide by overdosing, deliberately overdosing on a number of medications. This is an incredibly unusual and disturbing story. His partner, and I, I presume that this means that this was a gay man, and it refers to his romantic partner, Michael Cossey, told the Key West police that Hamilton was, quote, very upset about the election results, according to the reports in the Miami Herald. Hamilton had reportedly warned Cossey, his partner, that, quote, if Barack gets reelected, I'm not going to be around. We're still awaiting official autopsy results, and the police have said that there's absolutely no evidence of foul play. In addition to his anguish over the results over the election, Hamilton also had been, quote, very stressed about his business. Police officer Pablo Rodriguez reportedly showed up at their condo where Cossey was sleeping on the couch after returning home in the early morning hours after being out with friends. When Rodriguez woke Cossey, the man went to check on Hamilton and found him dead in his room next to an empty bottle of Xanax and an empty bottle of Seroquel, which is it used to treat schizophrenia. Cossey said the men hadn't even spoken since watching the election results on November 6th. This is a very unusual story, Lewis. Was this a gay couple? Uh, how did the police officer even think to show up if Cossey was still sleeping? There's just so many unanswered questions here. And was he schizophrenic? Well, he did have a prescription for Seroquel. And, you know, clearly this is a man who is mentally ill. We should be compassionate. His problems obviously went way further than the election. But we have to ask, how did he initially get the idea of the election as a kind of turning point for deciding about killing himself? We well, have to assume that he was suicidal for reasons that went completely beyond the election. However, probably. somehow, in his internal logic, the idea that the election results were a reason to kill himself became an idea. But, and we don't know what that is. Right. I, I have to applaud this ban uh, for a couple of reasons. Of all the insane reactions we've seen to the president winning, uh, a woman uh, running over her husband and who might die, right. uh, people threatening to kill the president... Um, I'm sure a shooting rampage or two that we have yet to see. Killing yourself is actually pretty reasonable compared it's, to that. It, you're saying it, it's, it's least harmful to people other than yourself, least, other right. than the emotional impact right. of... of at, at least he's not threatening to kill other people and do something of that nature. So, What do you think about that, Natan? I don't know. It seems like this guy maybe had like a more, even more incoherent reaction or opinion of the election than other people like other people say that it's a huge government intrusion into their lives there's you know a lot of uh, uh under the surface racism just because there's a black president who got reelected. but this guy it seems like if he is gay maybe it was just incoherent like he was against it but he didn't even know why he was against it very odd story I, i'm sure the schizophrenia has something to do with all of this that's your you would guess that yes all right Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is the New York Jets' backup quarterback. He has just signed on to be the new spokesman for TiVo, which is the home television and internet recording device. TiVo announced the sponsorship Wednesday morning with a one-minute video where Tim Tebow talks about the virtues of TiVo. It's a little complicated. Tim Tebow and TiVo. All right, anyway, here's the video that announced that. What's up, y'all? I'm Tim Tebow. Some of y'all might know me from playing football, but I actually have a life outside of football. And I like to keep that life pretty simple. But it seems like life gets more complicated every single day. Exactly like TV. It's cable, satellite, the web, tablets, and phones. The choice is great, but it's chaotic. That's why I like TiVo. It's, it's not just an ordinary DVR. It's like a magic box that goes out and searches on Hulu and Amazon. Okay, yeah, so incredibly compelling and magical advertisement there. Now, what's the concern? The concern is this. Uh, Tebow is a devout Christian who sparked some controversy during the 2010 Super Bowl. You remember this, Lewis. Of course. Focus on the Family, the known hate group, the anti-gay hate group, ran a pro-life commercial that featured Tim Tebow and his mother. Now, Tivo is using Tim Tebow's, quote, family-friendly reputation to tout their product, right? In other words, there were, there's going to be this Tebow zone on Tivo, which is going to be recommended content for kids from TV and the web. 
My concern is this. Focus on the Family is a hate group. It was founded by James Dobson. They are opposed to same-sex marriage. They are driving an anti-gay crusade, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, who watches these groups. They misrepresented research to make incredibly absurd claims like gays and lesbians don't make good parents. They misused research to promote that ex-gay conversion therapy where you can counsel someone into no longer being gay. Uh, one of our listeners, Dan, sent in a letter to TiVo questioning, wait a second, why are you having Tim Tebow be the face of TiVo now, given his association with this hate group, Focus on the Family? Now, they actually replied to Dan, and Dan sent me this email earlier. He said, they wrote to him, hello, Dan, thank you for contacting TiVo customer support. TiVo employees, partners, and associates are made up of a wide array of personal views. TiVo does not endorse the personal views of any individual or organization. The problem I have with it is this. TiVo has indicated they are going to be donating uh, some money to the Tim Tebow Foundation, which is involved with a lot of these right-wing conservative groups. I would be very, very concerned about this circle that is now being created. Personally, I would steer completely clear of TiVo at this point. Well, I had no plans to, uh, to use TiVo. I don't own a TiVo, and it's, it's out of the question for me anyway. I find it fascinating that we're still uh, talking about a backup quarterback and that a backup quarterback is being used in commercials. Oh, so you think that... The, so talk about that a little bit, because you follow football quite a bit. Is Tim Tebow now kind of irrelevant in the football world? He is irrelevant. Recently, one of his own teammates uh, called him terrible. Oh, is that right? And, uh, I mean, normally in the, in the football world, you just don't talk about backup quarterbacks. Well, this even further suggests the idea that, th th given his irrelevance in football... It has to be something about his associations or something about him personally that's making TiVo have him involved. Maybe not. I mean, his celebrity, for, for some reason, has kind of lingered. Um, I think, he, you know, when he blew up in the, in the National Football League, when he was with Denver, it was a huge thing. And some of that is still around. But I think it would make more sense to have Mark Sanchez doing these commercials. I, I, I don't know. All right. Well, be aware. There is a connection with hate group focused on the family and Tim Tebow. And for me, not that I was planning on getting a TiVo, but now I'm definitely not going to get one. And I encourage you not to until this is all resolved. Thank you, David. No problem. Hey, uh, this is really odd. We've had a lot of strange Pat Robertson moments on this show from his 700 Club show. This may be the most awkward Pat Robertson moment that I can remember. He talks, the context is talking about the, the kind of romance, mystery, whatever novel, Fifty Shades of Grey. And he starts talking about pornography and asking his co-host direct questions about porn. It's really, really odd. And it almost seems like Pat Robertson's getting kind of turned on asking these questions. It's very odd. I'm going to play it for you. Take a look. And also, keep an, keep an ear out for at one point he refers to pornography pornography okay let's look a sweet christian girl lady absolutely all right do you see anything in porn that attracts you at all no pat these well, questions that you ask me i'm well, like really I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get your attitude <laughs> no you that is not an issue for me thank you very well, much okay Creepy old man alert right here. Anybody else getting this vibe? He's kind of snickering and smirking about asking the young girl about porn. I mean, yeah. he, seems, he seems turned on by this. I feel very bad for this woman. Let's continue. Ring, really? Well, uh, for you some people... Do, look, all right, the thing that shocks me, shocks me, we always thought this was a male thing. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. A boy thing, yeah. a guy thing. Yeah. But now, mm -hmm. it looks like... 30% of women yeah. are involved in pornography. Yeah. <laughs> and there's... Did you know that, Lewis? 30% of women are involved in pornography. Hmm. That's, it. That's shocking. I didn't know that pornography existed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you need and... a pornograph to watch pornography? Yeah. It's a, what's, what movie is that a reference to? Uh, the Trial. Orson Welles' The Trial. So, and then, of course, in any Pat Robertson clip, he has to relate it back to what? Gay men. So now let's watch him. This is a professional, ladies and gentlemen. He now is able to pivot from female pornography to gay men. A, a author, kind of a little housewifey 
type yeah. uh, who uh, uh, it doesn't look like some glamour queen or something out of, uh, you know. Uh, but you know what, Pat? This summer, the big book was Fifty Shades of, was it well, Fifty Shades of Grey? That's one I'm getting ready to interview. I yeah. like that. Oh, she I'm doesn't sorry, know. Me... She's like, you know, the big book was Fifty Shades of, and then she says, oh, wait a second. I'm not really supposed to know about this. So I'm going to look off camera and say, what was it? Fifty Shades? Of, what, what was that book? As if she has no idea. And now the transition to gay men. I'll let you talk. But it's true. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, Everybody was mean, reading the this, trilogy. This woman is, is kind of like a, a housewife in some little town in England or wherever it is. Fifty Shades of Grey is the fastest selling paper book of all time. And the book's erotic content is limp. Some to call it mommy porn. And while most people think of pornography as something men struggle with, a third of, a, of the millions of Americans who watch porn are women. Yes. Who thought? I mean, that's there we go. Have. Let's just be brought, bring it into gay men. It's the fastest selling paper book. That's also interesting. I've read that plastic books, steel books, and chocolate books don't sell that well. Paper books are really the ones that we're concerned I've with. I've heard they last the longest and that the print is very uh, easy to read. Very odd. Pornography. And relating everything back to gay men. Creepy. Just downright creepy. But uh, par for the course for Pat Robertson. Absolutely. Yeah. Very sad story out of Galway, Ireland. A woman was denied an abortion and she died in a hospital. This is Savita Praveen Halapanavar, 31 years old. She died from septicemia following a miscarriage which lasted almost three days. She repeatedly asked for the fetus to be removed. Her requests were turned down. Now, why is this? Well, there's a complicated legal situation about this. There's a 1992 ruling called the X case where the Supreme Court found that abortion is permitted in Ireland under the Constitution in circumstances where there is a quote real and substantial risk to the life of the mother. However, no government has actually introduced legislation to enact the ruling. In other words, we have a ruling from the court, but that is not enough to act on it. There needs to be a ruling from the government to actually create legislation here, which makes a total gray area for medical practitioners. The fetus was not removed for three days, three days from when she was first admitted to the hospital after the fetal heartbeat had stopped, making it, I guess, legally not an abortion. Immediately afterwards, she was brought into a high dependency unit, which I think is equivalent to intensive care, as we would call it here in the US. And she was suffering from, from septicemia. She died four, four days later. Now, I want to remind you that there are people here in the U.S. who believe there is no such thing as life or health of the mother. Case in point, listen to this. No such exception as life of the mother. And as far as health of the mother, same thing with advances in science and technology. But let's assume that maybe that didn't mm -hmm. work or something. Okay, and as we get into Todd Aiken there accidentally and the legitimacy of rape, this is real, Lewis. People here in the U.S., some, some people on the right, think there's no such thing. This condition which just happened here just does not exist. These are the real dangers of not having access, safe legal access to these procedures. And this is a legal thing. There's this legal gray area for practitioners which led to this woman dying. And the baby, by the way. Right. The baby also died. We've got we've to get on the right path here. Right. We, we can't let this happen. Of course, this did not happen in this country, but uh, it is happening. But it does. Country. It, it yeah. happens all over the place. Right. And, and it would happen way more if Republicans got their way, if Roe v. Wade was overturned, which could have happened had Mitt Romney been elected and been able to make some changes to the Supreme Court pending retirements. We, we, this, this is very, very real, ladies and gentlemen. Too real. Scary stuff. On today's bonus show, we'll talk about a rat infestation. We'll talk about rockets striking a Tel Aviv suburb. We'll also talk about the power is still out in a New York City high rise with elderly people living there. It's an incredible situation. You should get the bonus show, davidpackman.com slash membership. Support the show. Get the bonus show. It's a win-win for everybody. Of course. Check it out. We'll be back after this. Great interviews today. You're not going to want to miss today's interview. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com.
welcome back to The David Pakman Show. The David Pakman Show membership program is made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Do you sometimes gaze into your cereal bowl in the morning and think you see liberal bias in there? You're not alone. Find out more at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Keith Leahy. Keith Leahy, finally a name I'm comfortable knowing I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm not so sure, David. It's been like a week or two since we've actually had a name where I could say with certitude, to quote Anthony Weiner, that uh, I, I felt like I had a good grasp on how to say it. But you still could be wrong. There's a chance. How else might it be pronounced? I don't know. But sometimes people like to pronounce their names differently from the norm. I think that it's possible that Leahy, sometimes people pronounce it Leahy. Yes. Very, very rarely. Let's hope that's not the case here. If I had to bet $10,000 on it, like Mitt Romney, I would say it's Keith Leahy. All right. Well, you're pretty confident. I hope I'm right. Hey, you know all these secessionists, the tens of thousands of people who have been signing the petition saying they want their state to secede from the union? Obviously, there's not any states that are dumb enough to do that, especially when um, uh, they, they, would, they would realize that they receive so much money from the federal government that it would be immediately a significant problem. Even people saying that Texas has a balanced budget, it's balanced taking into consideration the federal money that they receive. I think that right. fact is lost on a lot of people. Here's another idea. Why not just renounce your citizenship, right? If you are so desperate to sever your ties to the United States because you think you would be better off not burdened by an American citizenship, federal law makes it pretty straightforward to renounce your citizenship. You have to meet a few requirements. You appear before, uh, you have to be there in person at a U.S. Consul consular or other diplomatic office in a foreign country, usually an embassy, sometimes a consulate, sign an oath of renunciation, and you're out. Why not do that if you're so desperate to sever ties with the U.S.? This is Somehow I don't think they're going to do that. This is brilliant because your state will never secede from the United States. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and if secessionists renounce their citizenship, if everyone who signed that, that petition uh, renounced their citizenship, it would be the best thing that ever happened to the United States. In a way. In the history of its existence. Maybe Mitt Romney actually had the answer. Remember when he talked about self-deportation and we thought it didn't make any sense? In a way, go to another country and renounce your citizenship because you no longer want to be associated with this country. It's kind of similar to the Mitt Romney idea, isn't it? Right. And then these people, I assume, will have a different view on the U.S. immigration policy. Yes, I assume that that, that will change drastically. Right. All right, let's get into our first interview. After the break, just wait till you hear this debate that I had with Craig Smith over the economy. It's fantastic. But before we do that, first, let's check in with Dennis Campbell. It is Thursday, time for World View with Dennis Campbell. Dennis is editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine, also author of the book Billionaire Boys Election Freak Show. Dennis also has a beard for the first time since he's been doing the segments with us every Thursday. Dennis, tell us about that. Well, I'm uh, participating in something called Movember. It's something we do over here in the UK to help raise awareness of uh, prostate cancer, a disease that affects a number of men. My father indeed had it, and uh, I'm uh, growing since the 1st of November. Uh, the whiskers are coming in. They're quite itchy, and my wife will have nothing to do with me whatsoever <laughs> for lots of obvious reasons, but also the fact that there's now uh, 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 hair growth coming here. But it's for a good cause, and uh, you've graciously agreed to put the Indiegogo link on the, the clip that eventually ends onto YouTube, so if folks feel so inclined, they can make a donation via PayPal and whatever. So at post-election, we've seen a lot of scrutiny here in the U.S. over media reporting, both pre- and post-election, discussions of polling organizations, just broadly discussions of what is a legitimate news agency, for lack of a better term, and, and how should we evaluate it as such. And we, of course, have the regular media turmoil that is uh, kind of a, a constant here in the U.S. The U.K. also seems to be having some media turmoil, and it's centering around the BBC. Give us a sense of what's going on. Well, this venerable institution, the British Broadcasting Corporation, 90 years old, has uh, had scandal after scandal rocket. It started about a month and a half ago with the revelations that a man who was the equivalent in some respects of the U.S. Dick Clark, this was a man by the name of Jimmy Savile, 
very well known, very popular, but unfortunately he has the same sort of proclivities as Jerry Sandusky. It's alleged that he led, and he's since passed away, so this is all being done, you know, post his departure, that uh, he led a very serious child abuse operation that was covered over by the BBC. The BBC's program, their, their signature news program every evening, every evening called Newsnight, started to do an investigation towards the end of last year. Uh, apparently there was some pressure put on it to not run the story and instead just after Christmas they ran, the BBC as a network, ran a tribute to Jimmy Savile and all the work that he's done. This really began to uh, blossom and move out of control as story after story of former youths that he had abused have come forward. To make matters worse, they've not only covered that up, but Newsnight apparently came out with a story again talking about a care home to the north of us here in Wales where a number of children had been abused and they alleged in the story that a senior Tory or conservative, what would be a Republican in the United States official, was involved in a pedophilia ring inside of these care homes. His name was Lord McAlpine. And Lord McAlpine, of course, was proven not to be found guilty at all. So there's another sting on the reputation of the BBC, as well as a falsely reported news story, again from the television program Newsnight. The end result has been the new director general, a man who's been on the job for eight days, Mr. Entwistle, resigned abruptly, as did the head of news and his deputy. And now this scandal has the potential potential to move across the ocean to your side of the pond where the former BC, BBC director general is now the CEO of the New York Times. So in the US if this were to happen for example with PBS or any organization that receives some kind of public funding we know what the calls would be right away that all funding must be absolutely ceased. Now explain to us in the UK individuals make payments to the BBC is that not right? It's yeah. We we pay every every household in 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 the UK pays something called a TV license. They're very common across Europe. I paid for one also in the Netherlands, and you you pay an annual fee. It's about a hundred and thirty pounds a year, which is a little over two hundred dollars. It's a form of a tax, and what that does is that gives you the the right to use the the airwaves and the money that's raised. Those license fees are what fund the BBC and public television here in the UK. Now, does, now everybody, people, is that, does everyone have to pay that? Is it only if you have a, a television subscription? How does that work? If you have a television set in your home, you're required by law to pay the licensing fee. Okay. So that are also there... Includes, yeah, that also includes computers, uh, devices, etc. But they're all covered under it. There's very few exceptions where people in this day and age do not have a television set of some kind. Is there any blowback now regarding how the BBC is funded in light of what's going on? It's not a question of blowback of how it's funded. Nothing like what you're seeing with, with PBS. Right. But there is a bit of blowback on... Um, there have been a huge number of budget cuts. The fee, the license fee has been frozen in place now for I believe the last three years running, if not longer. And uh, it's the sort of thing that, you know, we really have to, um, we really have seen dramatic cutbacks in news budgets. Uh, uh, in particular here in Wales, for example, we've lost a couple of political broadcasts. Uh, quite frankly, they were shows that I made a lot of appearances on that uh, were around Prime Minister's Question Time and local, local uh, political shows. And you're seeing it also in programming. You're also seeing huge numbers of staff being consolidated. All of the drama production, for example, so shows like Doctor Who and uh, all of the, the, the regular shows that are put together that are now all filmed here. Most of the news programming comes out of Salford, which is next to Manchester. So they're, they're really trying to get as many resources out of central London, where it's very expensive for real estate, and all of the regional BBCs are really being paired back dramatically. All right, so we're going to keep an eye on the story. We've been speaking with Dennis Campbell. He is editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine, joins us on Thursdays for World View with Dennis Campbell. Thanks as always, Dennis. Thank you. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.
Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to the show. Just a few minutes ago, I had the chance to speak with Craig Smith. He's chairman of Swiss America and author of the book, The Great Debasement. We got pretty much uh, into it in, a, in more than seven or eight minutes that we normally have. So we're putting the entire interview up on our YouTube channel. So check that out. Here's part of that interview for you to take a look at. Well, I don't know about that because let's talk about, let's talk about the minutia there a little bit. If you do increase taxes on the wealthiest Americans, we're not talking about the corporate tax rate here. We're talking about the personal, the, the top marginal income tax on the wealthiest Americans. That's not going to have a, a negative effect on the economy because those are people that are all, they're still going to be able to afford the same houses, the same cars. They're not going to buy any less food, so on and so forth. So I actually agree that separating the Bush tax cuts as one large thing into the tax cuts for the richest people and the middle class tax cut makes sense because the middle class tax cut will be stimulative. That money will be spent. The rich will save that money. Well, well, let, let's analyze that. Yeah. First off, 50, 54 percent of people that make over two hundred thousand dollars a year are filing their taxes as small businesses, as private individuals. That's how I did it 30 years ago when I started my firm. So let's make sure that we we're not just talking about rich. You're absolutely right. Rich people are not going to be are not going to be affected by a 4% increase in their taxes. Glad quite, we agree. quite frankly, it's going to be irrelevant to them. Exactly. But it's going to mean less money in their private pockets that, as you say, could be saved, which goes into banks, than is allowed to be lent out to create an economy. Okay, let's stop there, though. When, let's stop when, there when, for when a second. We have to stop there for a second, though, because we have to compare what is the stimulative effect of a rich person putting that money in the bank and then the jobs that creates in banking versus, for example, and, and I know you, a lot of people don't like this example, food stamps, which is known to have an exponentially higher multiplier effect because that money is absolutely going to be spent. That is then goes to a supermarket, that goes to the supplier, so on and so forth. So the stimulative effect is way lower of the savings. Wait a minute, David, you've fallen, fallen into the typical misunderstanding of food stamps that was presented by Nancy Pelosi. Okay, <laughs> she said those people spend it right away. You act as though this money is coming from somewhere. We have to borrow that money, David. If you took, if you raise taxes on the rich 100%, you're still not going to have enough money to make everything work. But let's say we do do it for 4% and it generates $80 billion. Okay. Okay, we're now spending between food stamps, Title VIII, and Medicaid a trillion dollars a year, David. So will it have any negative impact on the market? I believe it will. One thing I can assure you, it will have no positive impact on the market. Let's talk about what could have a positive impact. Let's put taxes to the side for a minute. Yeah. Let's just say you're right. And I'll stipulate that we can raise taxes on the wealthy. Okay, do it for five years so there's certainty. Now at the same time say we're going to cut entitlement spending, not against the baseline, but real cuts, meaning if we spent a trillion dollars this year, we're only going to spend $900 billion next year with legitimate cuts and hold them for five years, then say you are going to suspend the unknown regulations that are coming from Obamacare, which now Denny's is going to be charging a 5% surtax on each bill that they have and putting people in a part-time status so they don't have to pay them benefits. Yeah, but that's the same Papa John's pizza nonsense. The reality is that business hiring really depends on demand, and demand will be stimulated by middle and lower income people being able to afford your product. Product. So the idea, the, the simple economic concept of, of marginal revenue tells us that you would make hiring decisions based on supply and demand from your customers. Uh, that, that this is where I feel people are getting totally mixed up. Okay, but David, fair enough. If you go to a college, that's what you're going to read in a textbook. I started this company 31 years ago with $50 out of the bedroom of my home. We now build $250 million a year. So I think I have a little experience in how you create demand. You don't have to wait for demand to come. You can go out and create the demand. Okay. And that's, and that's the problem. We have this belief, David, that there's only one pie. And so then why doesn't Denny's create more demand, regardless of what the government does? Because they don't know what their costs are going to be on Obamacare. <laughs> they don't know if tomorrow the FDA is going to come out with a new regulation that turns around and says that they're not going to be able to serve fatty foods or salty foods or 16-ounce drinks. I mean, David, all those regulations have an effect. And look, I'm not blaming all this on Mr. Obama. Let's, well, let's, let's take back. a step back then, because I, I want to step back from Obama just for a second, because a lot of times, a lot of the arguments you're making are made specifically when it's Democrats in office. And I ran some numbers, and I saw that 
stock, re stock market returns are so much higher over the last 80 years when we've had Democratic presidents than when we've had Republican presidents. Domestic industrial production has increased significantly every time there's a Democratic president and has actually decreased slightly when we have Republican presidents. On 11 of 12 economic indicators, the economy does far better under Democratic than Republican presidents. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just made a terrible mistake. Okay. You said the stock market did better. The stock market is not the economy, David. I understand. Those I'm giving are, you a, you, well, there's a number of indicators we, we, here. Uh, that's one we, of 12. Uh, okay. You have production. That doesn't trickle down always to profit. Many okay. corporations. Okay. So let's keep going, though. You're into, I mean, growth in personal disposable income after taxes, growth 2.92% annualized under Democratic presidents, 0.53% under Republicans. Every I, indicator, I guess you're Craig, leaving every out the indicator. last four years then, because under the last four years, the average American's income middle class has gone down $4,300. So apparently you're conveniently leaving out the last four I'm years. I'm including them. We're averaging this out over the last 80 years. And remember, President Obama was trying to recover from a horrible economic situation left to him by George W. Bush. Oh, yes, horrible. No, no worse than what Reagan inherited. And Reagan was well on our way to growth right now. Yes, he increased deficits, but so did Mr. Obama. He took us up from 10 trillion to 16 trillion. And again, I, look, I'm not blaming Mr. Obama. Let me make something very clear to you because I think you and I agree on more than we disagree. Maybe. George, George Bush, while he kept this country safe, was a horrible president from a fiscal responsibility standpoint. Absolutely. He, ne he never had the guts to take a veto pen out and say, no, I'm not going to allow that spending to occur. Yeah. So you're not going to find a big fan, a fiscal fan of George Bush and this fella here. Okay. But, 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 but I can tell you that whether it was under uh, uh, John F. Kennedy or whether it was under Ronald Reagan or quite frankly, whether it was under the first few years of George Bush, tax cuts work. We might not like the net effects of them, but they work. We don't have an income problem in Washington, D.C. David, we have a spending problem. Everybody doesn't want to talk about the 900-pound gorilla in the room, and that's entitlements. And look, you and I would agree on this. Is it fair to say to a Social Security person that's paid in money every year that they're going to have to have their benefits cut? Of course not. They've paid that money in, correct? Yeah. But people pay their money into Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was a crook. He stole the money. He's <laughs> well, in we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. We're getting a little bit. I, I, this well, is a long discussion. In consideration, David. It's a long discussion, and I apologize. We don't have more time. The last okay. number I want to leave you with, Craig, is this. Growth of corporate after-tax profit, meaning it takes into consideration the so-called high taxes under Democrats. 4.53% right. annualized growth of corporate after-tax profit under Democrats an 11.6% decrease annualized of after-tax profit under Republicans. Well, We've got to look at the numbers, Craig. We've got to be well, aware Dave, of them. Dave, David, David, okay, let's, let's take a bigger window then. Let's go over the last 150 years and run those numbers, and we can distort the numbers. But what always matters, the, ma the numbers don't matter. Oh, they don't. How is the, aver how is the average American being affected, David? Well, that's what, what the numbers it? tell us. How can we say the numbers don't matter? Th the numbers David, are all that matter. David, then Mr. Obama should have won in a landslide instead of a very close election if he's done such a magnificent job running the he economy. He did. He won by more than 100 electoral votes. He won every minority group. He won women he won 55 by, to he 45. He won by 2%, David. Oh, come on, this Craig. Was... He, won in a sign... he won by way more than George W. Bush did in 2004. Okay. I, I, I can't, I... Wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold on a minute now. Mr. Obama got less votes in 2012 than he got in 2008, and Mr. Romney got less votes in 2012 than Mr. McCain got in 2008. Okay, so let's not kid ourselves. Why didn't we go to a fully Democratic Congress then? then because of uh, gerrymandering and redistricting. We know why. Okay. I, I, you know, I, 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 You don't like you my answers, Craig, but I have everything. answers. That's the thing. David, you see everything politically, and I can tell you this, okay? <laughs> Good politics make bad economics, and good economics make bad politics. We've and got we to look at the numbers. We want to deal with economics or politics. <laughs> we have a financial mess, not just because of this. All right. <laughs> We're having, and, and Craig, I don't mean, your, your mic is cutting in and out, and we've reached the end of our time. So we'll have you back. I know there's more to discuss. I want to tell people, if they want a free copy of your new book, The Great Debasement, just call 800-289-2646. You'll send them out a free copy. Craig Smith, Chairman of Swiss America. Thanks as always, Craig. David, I appreciate you doing your homework. You're a very well-prepared host, and I look forward to future dialogue. Okay, thank you. We'll take a break and be back with more after this.
The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. This program is mostly supported by individual memberships. Please consider supporting us by becoming a member at davidpakman.com slash membership. We're talking about pennies a day. You'll get access to the bonus show, audio and video podcast, the commercial free podcast of the show, as well as full one hour commercial free video episodes as well. It's the whole package, Lewis. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. Ron Paul has given what is being considered his farewell address to Congress. Ron Paul is retiring at the end of the year. He had a lot to say. Let's get to a little bit of that speech here, Lewis, and uh, get some of our thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, this may be the last time I speak on the House floor. At the end of the year, I'll leave Congress after 23 years in office over a 36-year period. My goals in 1976 were the same as they are today, promote peace and prosperity by a strict adherence to the principles of individual liberty. It was my opinion that the course of the U.S. embarked on in the latter part of the 20th century would bring us a major financial crisis and engulf us in a foreign policy that would overextend us and undermine our national security. To achieve these goals, I sought, the government would have had to shrink in size and scope, reduce spending, change the monetary system, and reject the unsustainable cost of policing the world and expanding the American empire. So let's stop there. He later went on and he said he actually kind of lamented that he wasn't able to really do that much of what he set out to do, which was rein in excessive government and stop these unconstitutional wars of aggression. So, you know, at least we can say he was actively fighting against the military industrial complex. We can say that Ron Paul is, is, is on his way out. He's retiring. That's perfectly fine. However, we've been asked, you know, we've had so many debates involving Ron Paul over the last four years or so. And we had a lot that we disagreed with Ron Paul about, including Ron Paul thought that the, uh, uh, he was against the minimum wage. He was against antitrust laws. He thought that the 16th Amendment to the Constitution establishing a progressive income tax was unconstitutional. He wanted to eliminate the departments of agriculture, education, energy, commerce, health, hu health and human services, labor, wanted to get rid of the EPA, Obamacare, the IRS. We could go on and on. But what can we say about Ron Paul? We, I guess we're doing what everybody else does, which is when somebody retires, you, you say something good about them. And I guess the good is he was against the military industrial complex, right? Yes. And he... Uh... I mean, he was certainly an independent voice in in the Congress. Um, he he fought hard, and he achieved some success as a third party candidate. Uh, I mean, w what else can we say? He wasn't really a third party candidate, except sometimes until the, at the very end when he right. didn't have the Republican right. nomination for different things. What's your thought, Natan, on on Ron Paul's retirement? Right. I think he did run as a, the Libertarian Party candidate uh, two decades ago, yeah. if I remember correctly. But uh, my thoughts are uh, now we have to deal with Rand Paul. Good luck. That, that certainly I, I would rather deal with Ron Paul. <laughs> yes. I would as well. I agree there. No question about it. So maybe a little bit of a pessimistic thing. Ran, uh, Ron Paul being replaced with Rand Paul, who seems to be even further outside of logic and reason. Yes. Mitt Romney ran a campaign which insisted on not raising taxes for the rich, and on a whole bunch of other stuff that didn't make sense economically. Mitt Romney's economic advisor, Glenn Hubbard, just published an op-ed in the Financial Times, which actually called for higher tax rates on the wealthy, and it urged Republicans to outline specific spending cuts instead of vague across-the-board reductions. Noteworthy because it is exactly counter to what Mitt Romney ran on. This was one of Romney's advisors. So what does this tell us? It basically tells us that even economists who know what they are talking about are not really allowed to have their ideas heard or they are simply told to advise Mitt Romney on doing the opposite of what they actually think would be good. I mean, it is sad because obviously 
this isn't an idea that Glenn Hubbard just came up with in the week since Mitt Romney lost, right? This is obviously something that he thought all along, but for whatever reason, never actually trickled all the way up to Mitt Romney's policy proposals. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he was uh, suppressed, for for lack of a better term. Or, apparently, Mitt Romney was even lying about what his own economic advisors thought would help the country. Maybe Glenn Hubbard's voice was actually heard within the Romney campaign. And Mitt Romney said, you know what, I'm going to even lie about what my own economic advisors are telling me because uh, that's what he thinks will help him win the presidency, because that's what he thinks. Now, Glenn Hubbard didn't just say that President Obama's strategy is fantastic. He said a strategy of taxing the rich cannot pay for the entitlement state. If we wanted a larger government as a share of GDP, we would have to raise taxes substantially on everyone. Mr. Obama cannot argue that we can right the fiscal ship simply by taxing the rich. No, I would agree with that. We need other things, including maybe an even bigger stimulus than we had would have been beneficial. Major cuts to military spending. What's your thought, Natan, on uh, this revelation from Glenn Hubbard? I guess Glenn Hubbard's doubling down on trickle-down government. Um, and I guess I'm happy for him because uh, <laughs> it seems to be like what's happening after this election is some Republicans, obviously not all, are coming down to earth and embracing facts and what would actually be good for the country as opposed to what would be good for winning an election, which turned out to not be true because they lost the election running on those things. So breath of fresh good. air, Lewis. Indeed. Let's get to your voicemails. You can call our voicemail line any time of day, 219-2-DAVID-P. Here is a voicemail about Mitch McConnell and the Kentucky Senate. Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering what you guys thought about the idea of uh, Ashley Judd running for U.S. Senate in Kentucky mm. in uh, 2014 against uh, Mitch McConnell. Do you think she guys should do it? Do you think she will do it? Do you think she can? Do you think she's a, a shot at it? Um, just wondering what you guys, what your you know opinions were on that. All right. Well, listen, anything's better than Mitch McConnell. I would certainly prefer Ashley Judd over Mitch McConnell. I'm not intimately familiar with Ashley Judd's qualifications, but merely the fact that she has not done things terribly as Mitch McConnell has done already puts her above him. Right now. What did she say about it? She said, I quote, quote, I cherish Kentucky heart and soul. And while I'm very honored by the consideration, we have just finished an election. So let's focus on coming together to keep America, uh, America's families moving and especially our kids moving forward. What did Mitch McConnell's office say about it? That he said, Senator McConnell and his wife are big fans of Ashley Judd's movies and appreciate her energy, especially when it comes to bringing young people into the political process. Right. So in English, that means Ashley Judd said, yes, I'm going to run. And Mitch McConnell said, bring it on. <laughs> Is that the translation? I think so. I don't really care that much about, you know, actors specifically getting involved. I'm more interested. We don't have time today, but I'm more interested in the story of a new congressman who is a physicist, and he wants more scientists in Congress. I think that that is absolutely something we need. Ashley Judd specifically, she may well be very qualified. We'll see. It's too early to tell. I'm not opposed to her candidacy. Right. And like, I mean, I liked her statement there. It was it was intelligent. It was thoughtful. Sure. It made sense. It did. And Mitch McConnell is the devil. So I think uh, I my vote would go to Ashley Judd. <laughs> On the homeless man arrested for charging his cell phone in a park, Maybe if, if the street lights are on, you could be arrested if your eyes are open and you're using the light to walk by in this bad economy. Maybe in this bad economy, we could save money for the electric bill by firing dumb cops like this, referring to the individual who arrested the homeless man. People getting very angry over this homeless man arrest story, Lewis. And they should be. It's completely absurd. And then, so what you're saying is he got his phone charged and a free meal in jail? If I'd have been that guy, I'd be quite happy with how it turned out. Yeah, I'm not too sure about that. I'm just not uh, not convinced about that. No, I mean, he might have come out ahead overall, but these things should not happen. There you go. On the bonus show today, a rat infestation. We will discuss it. We'll talk about rockets striking a Tel Aviv suburb. And we will talk about power remaining out in some parts of New York City. If you don't get the bonus show yet, Sign up. This is the time to support independent media. It's the way forward. It's not those three-letter news networks, okay? DavidPakman.com slash membership. Sign up. Pennies a day. All the benefits. So much great stuff. Next week, a little bit of a shortened week because of Thanksgiving, but we will be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Great shows coming up. A lot of exciting interviews. Stay tuned. 
And of course, answering audience questions on YouTube. Go to our YouTube channel. We've been taking a bunch of great questions, including Lewis's romantic life and his tattoos and video games and all sorts of stuff. Check it out on YouTube. We will see you Monday. Unless you get the bonus show, then we'll see you right now. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.